You see, your mug is better quality than mine. We are now recording. Yay! Yay. Like you're you're here. Charlotte, I love your mug. I think it's fab. You can tell us more about it in a minute. But Charlotte, Joshua, yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's just I, mean, I see you in the flesh, sort of. Actually in the flesh. Actually yeah. real people, not just avatars on Facebook. Uh, Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> Voguing Vickers. Oh, what are the next? Oh, that's a whole different conversation right there. That's right. a whole different <laughs> video for, for after hours. Um, it is nice to see you, Charlotte. Thank you for being another one of my victims. Uh, sorry, interviewees. <laughs> <laughs> this series on shielding clergy and um, let's start with the the easy stuff which is uh before covid bc uh what were you doing in terms of professional life and household life what was going on for you okay so i am in leeds diocese in west yorkshire mm -hmm. and i have a 50 percent responsibility for two churches christ church mold green and st james wellthorpe is half of my week and the other half of my week, I am the coordinating Anglican chaplain for the University of Huddersfield. Okay. So in my spare time, yeah, I have a lot of jobs. <laughs> and um, pre-COVID, my household was myself, my husband, Chris, and my son, Adam, and intermittently my stepson, George, as well as associated furry people, some of whom you I will see. just see a pinch over your shoulder, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I don't, I don't actually have a furry growth, just so you know, you know, <laughs> Not two late. dogs, two cats, a guinea pig, you know, <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty Noah's Ark in here. And life before COVID was, certainly home life was complicated by medical needs. Do you want to, yeah. in a nutshell, give us a snapshot of that? Okay, so on one level, there are my son's disabilities. My son, Adam, who is nine. Uh, when he was born, he had group B strep meningitis, and although he survived an infection that nobody ever thought he was going to survive, he was left with quite a number of disabilities as a, as a result. So he's hearing impaired, he's visually impaired, he's autistic, he's asthmatic, and he has quite a few learning difficulties that go along with that. So life has always been complex for the last nine years anyway. Yeah. Um, Two years ago, when I finished curacy and we, um, well, I felt the call to move to Yorkshire and to pursue this uh, post in Leeds Diocese, um, we decided to move up for the new adventure and it was always going to be all going to be wonderful and amazing. A year later, my husband, Chris, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Sure. Um, so for seven months before lockdown actually happened, mm. we were already in the midst of dealing with that horrible situation of uh, coping with his impending death, his symptoms. And so in many ways, um, having a quieter, more in the house, I suppose, sort of lifestyle started for us long before COVID because of my husband's illness. Sure. And, and just remind me, uh, when did Chris die? Chris died on the 24th of April, so about a month into lockdown. That's a lot to deal with, which could easily be a whole other set of interviews on how we deal with trauma and death. Um, probably not for now, um, but, it does, but it does kind of flavour your experience of, of what lockdown meant for you, not just as uh, a wife and a mother, uh, not just as part of a household, not just part as part of being a priest and a chaplain, but, yeah. but the additional layer of, of impending reality of grief yeah. uh, and all the complications of, of Chris's health as it deteriorated over that last month through the beginning of lockdown. So uh, without sounding glib, what did lockdown and shielding mean for you and how did it adjust how you were a priest and a chaplain and, and everything as part of life? Well, in certain respects, because of Chris's illness, I'd already been signed off work for a number of months yeah. in that sense. So if I take it on the doing aspect, I already wasn't doing much that is typically associated with priesthood. Um, and so I was spending an awful lot more time in the house anyway, because I was looking after Chris full time. And then when Adam was home from school, I was looking after him. But once it got to the point of lockdown, at that point in time, not only was my son Adam no longer in his special needs school, which is huge, 
um, because routine and structure is incredibly important to him. So it wasn't just a case of, oh, suddenly I have to try and homeschool my child, which I know everybody has dealt with. Um, having a child who has as many complex interlinking disabilities as my son does, it's not as simple a matter of saying, oh, here's some math wor worksheets, you can still do your homeschooling. So school shut down, and then on top of that, because of his disabilities, um, we have various other respite and disability type activities that are available to him um, so that he can interact and socialize with his peers who are other disabled children and all of those shut down as well. So for me, when lockdown happened, it was all of the lifelines, if you like, that had kept me sane in terms of dealing with Chris's illness oh. um, of it's OK, at least Adam is being looked after so I can focus on Chris. All of that went. Yeah. Um, so at that point in time, Chris was in the hospice, hmm. we were in the end of his life. So in some ways his medical needs were taken care of, yeah. but at the same time, knowing that my husband was nearing the end of his life, suddenly I couldn't visit him because yeah. I was full time looking after my autistic boy. So yeah, it was, despite already being off work, I guess what I'm saying is that it was a huge adjustment right from the start. And, and were, there, were there fears about, obviously, standard shielders just lock themselves in their homes and things are brought to them and there is no going beyond the front door. But of course, the complication you had or the additional challenge was, uh, I guess, Adam needs to go out because he needs to be beyond the house. And, and that routine of being out and in had gone. So there was that challenge there. But also you need to go out the house to go and visit the hospice, where, of course, that there's the transmission risk of leaving your front door is huge and having to balance all those things together. Um, I'm amazed you're still here and in one piece. <laughs> just about. <laughs> um, so just as lockdown was happening, there was sort of a, I guess you could say a bit of a bridge in that Chris was still at home for a while, although at that point in time he was bed bound. So as it was first starting to be planned, um, I was thinking that we would have to have a scenario where we would still have carers and district nurses and all that kind of thing come in to meet his very real and huge physical needs. Yeah. And how on earth do you shield in that kind yeah. of circumstance? Because um, the one thing I probably haven't said is that perhaps obviously there was a huge element of shielding for him um, because he had terminal cancer. I mean, it's kind mm -hmm. of obvious. But at the same time, I have incredibly severe asthma. It's not unusual for me to have all of the medication and rides in the nice yellow taxi with blue lights on top um, <laughs> and my son in addition to all of his disabilities also has moderate asthma but there's always been some suggestion that his immune system might be a little bit compromised because of the meningitis just because he he catches things more easily yeah so right at the beginning of lockdown we were kind of thinking okay we should be shielding for mm -hmm. obvious reasons but how on earth do we shield if we have to have nurses and carers and everything else come in and in some ways that was <laughs> solved, it sounds kind of awful, but solved by Chris going to the hospice because then all of his medical care was there. Yeah. But at the same time, as you quite rightly say, there was the, there's still an autistic child at home. Mm -hmm. And then there's still the scenario of me as his wife. I want to see my husband, particularly as I knew his life was coming to an end. Yeah. Um, but the hospice were also locking down. So in normal terms, the hospice is very family friendly and they're perfectly happy with you going with you staying with there being adults children they're they're fine with it but in covid times they had to suddenly become an awful lot more like a hospital and you have to wear the ppe and you have to have limited visitors and one of the many things of having an autistic child is that he cannot handle ppe yeah. he will not accept gloves a mask an apron he will yeah. just about wash his hands, yeah. but he won't accept everything else. So the one time that I tried to take him to visit Chris in the hospice and we had to put all the gear on, he was just in a mess, screaming on the floor was. and ripping yeah, all off because he yeah. couldn't Good handle time. it. Um, so complicated, I guess, is the answer. Sure. To the yeah. So complicated home life, complicated medical situations, all the challenges of life really complicated by COVID, just throwing everything up in the air that you would normally know how to deal with. Uh, mm. How about your priestly stuff, which is already slightly adjusted in the light of Chris and his needs. Um, how have you been a priest through all of this, uh, maintaining that priestly sense of presence 
um, and, and chaplaincy. How are you a chaplain from home with all this going on? Well, first of all, I have to say you are incredibly fortunate and I hope you consider yourself to be fortunate because I'm not in PJs today. And I've actually <laughs> put on a collar specifically oh, for oh, you. <laughs> I do hope you consider yourself to be hugely privileged in that. Although I am, I am intrigued by doing an interview series on clergy pajamas, but maybe not. <laughs> that would be a whole other conversation. <laughs> it would. Anyway. <laughs> I think the thing for me that has most definitely been a learning curve, it's not something that has been an instant overnight epiphany, um, it's a common conversation in clergy circles, but it's definitely one that I've had to confront recently. Is priesthood about doing or is priesthood about being? So mm -hmm. if I'm not wearing this on any given day, am I suddenly not a priest? <gasps> it comes off. Are you okay? I know it, it comes right. off. Amazing. Oh, wait, mine does that too, but it's a bit tight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'm not wearing that, does yeah. that mean Are I'm you not a priest? Not a priest? Yeah. If I'm not in my church building and celebrating the Eucharist or taking home communion to somebody, does that mean I'm suddenly not a priest? Well, no is the answer. Yeah. Um, and I've definitely had some periods during this lockdown where I've chosen to share things on the church website or on Facebook, or I've put sermons up or that kind of thing. Um, I had the incredibly poignant experience that um, I ended up giving last rites to my husband, which is not something I ever expected to be part of my priestly journey. But not trained for that, are we? <laughs> yeah, but in that moment in time in the hospice, nobody else could come in. So I was there as his next of kin, and I'm also a priest. Yeah. So I chose to, in that moment, put on that identity and to do priesting. Yeah. Um, but for me, it is about what my identity is, whether I'm wearing the collar or not, whether I'm working, whether I'm either in a building or whether I'm sharing things online, yeah. all of that yeah. notwithstanding, I'm still a priest. It's part yeah. of who I am. So even some of it has been about the way that I've asked the questions through yeah. this, because perhaps some people who might be Christians but not ordained mm -hmm. might certainly still be questioning this sort of thing through the lens of their faith, but I still encounter people sending me messages saying, can you still pray for me? Yeah. Or how on earth are you holding on to your faith in the midst of this? Don't you just want to tell God where to go? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> can I just say? <laughs> there has been a lot of Anglo-Saxon in the prayers and that's okay. Um, <laughs> but, but being a priest is about being. It's not necessarily about doing and sure there's a lot of doing in our work of course there is in normal times yeah. but as during this shutdown we've discovered so much of what our usual doing would be is stripped away mm -hmm. all of us I think as priests have had to find a new way of being and yeah. perhaps for me there's just been that extra layer of being signed off so I really don't have any obligation to do at all <laughs> but I am still a priest and to be fair there have been times when I have chosen to put a, face, uh, a sermon on the church website and I've had the archdeacon on the phone going, now Charlotte, you know you're signed off, you know you don't have to, yes, 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 I know, I know, I know, <laughs> and just that dealing with the, but I should be doing, of all of the mm. times that my congregations need my support, it definitely should be now, yeah. but I can't, and yeah. just treading that line has definitely been a learning experience and a challenge through all of this. Now here's a, an interesting question which I'm asking all of my uh, lovely interviewees which is God, uh, not explain God, that would be beyond the scope that, of that this. Beyond <laughs> this conversation. Trinity Sunday has been in God, we can do the heresy later. Um, but, <laughs> so <laughs> heresy Sunday. Everyone's <laughs> favourite Sunday. But, but something about God being present or not present or close or far away. And, and I love the fact that you were very honest and said, you know, in your prayers, which indicates you are still praying, which is a good thing. Um, there's been a lot of Anglo-Saxon, a lot of honesty, a lot of, you know, when I pray, there will be an honesty with God that, that goes beyond the social convention of politeness. And actually, uh, which indicates that God, at least sometimes, is, is close enough 
to hear you pray. So where has God been and your experience of, of being alongside God or not through, through this last few months? So to be perfectly honest, when Chris was first diagnosed, hmm. there was no praying going on. There was an awful lot of shouting at the sky and quite a lot of Anglo-Saxon that wasn't framed in a prayer. Um, and I do have to be honest about that because I may wear one of these and I might be a priest, but I am also still a human being and a wife and a mother who was thinking, what on earth is the future going to look like? <laughs> so in the early days, there was no praying. The thing, and, and at that point in time, when my bishop would come and visit me, because they've been wonderful in terms of that yeah. pastoral care and visiting me. So when my bishop would come and visit me, at that point in time, he would say, you know, if you can't pray, that's fine. In this season, we will pray for you and we will pray with you until such time as you're able to again. Yes. And as I said earlier, my son is autistic, and that means that he has very fixed, clear routines. So one of his routines is that before bed, once he's had his shower and put his nappy on, um, it's very, very fixed that we have to read stories, yeah. then it's time to pray, and what he means by that is saying the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Um, then it was time to pray for Daddy, and then it was time to sing our song, which for him is the Compline hymn, because, you know, every parent teaches their child an 8th century hymn. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell my nine-year-old, you'd be like, do one now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very soothing, it's very calming. It and and I say that because in those early days when I couldn't pray, Adam still had his routine and he still needed that routine. So he needed time to pray still to happen. Yeah. And at that point in time, I said the Lord's Prayer through gritted teeth and often tears pouring down my face. And I was doing it for him, not for me. But as I repeated those words that many people have called rote or habit, mm -hmm. as I had to repeat those every single day, eventually mm -hmm. they started to become prayers again. Yeah. And as I was thinking this question of where is God in the midst of this, mm -hmm. in lockdown, in shielding, in my husband's diagnosis, yeah. in the fact that we've already been through quite a bit with our son, um, it, where is God in all of this? And the thing that really held me was reflecting on some of the Bible passages that show that God is with us through the tough times. Mm -hmm. And another, I'd like to try and show you this, if you can see it on the camera. Another local member of clergy sent me this postcard, which is a depiction of the point when Jesus is walking on the water and Peter asks if he can, if he should come out of the boat and walk with him. Yes. Now, most of the depictions of that particular scene, I see two men walking on the waves, and Peter is maybe sinking down to his ankles, yeah. maybe yeah. even on a profound one, he's sinking down to his knees. Yeah. But for me, seeing this image, where yeah. the only thing you can see is his hand reaching up out of the waves, saying help, and in turn, Jesus' hand reaching down to grab him. Yeah. For me, that really spoke to me of... Huge in the midst of this time when it feels like i'm drowning it feels like god where are you have you abandoned me yeah. but there's still christ's hand reaching into the waves yeah and in the final months of chris's life because during this cancer diagnosis is when he finally discovered faith of his own he had always supported mine but hadn't had his own yeah. um but he chose to be confirmed last august and then in this last year of his life was exploring his own faith and I didn't actually show it to him, but he came across that verse in Isaiah 43. Mm -hmm. um, the one that says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. The reason that that gave him such comfort and in turn gave me such comfort was that as much as I might've wished it otherwise, it never said the waves and the water aren't going to happen. It never said the fire isn't going to happen. What it actually said is I'll be with you in it. Yeah. And if anybody had said to me in those moments in time, well, the waves aren't there because God's with you. The fire isn't there. Well, yeah, hello, it is. Yeah, and, look and around. That, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was that how on earth do you walk with faith somehow even when you feel like you're drowning managed to reach that hand up out of the waves and to grab god's hand and to say somehow just be with me in this 
if you can pull me out of it, that's great. But even if you can't, hold on to me. Yeah, don't let go. Don't let go. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's, that's been my thing through this. It's the times when I've been able to pray, the times when I haven't, the times when I simply have not been able to pray, if you like, from extempore words from my own heart. Mm. But it has actually been my autistic son that has kept me praying. Um, because it was non-negotiable to not say the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, that's what you did. Yeah. yeah. God bless Adam and his ministry. Look at that. Absolutely. He's only nine, but flipping heck. Our children, do you know, I, I do think children have a greater ministry than, mm. uh, than we give them credit for. We, the Church of England, the system. Um, and I said that as a former youth and children's worker, he's always been mm. passionate mm. about children ministering to adults um, in a yeah. safe way, obviously, but, you know, mm. rather than just potential potential ministers when they grow up like mm, no look through scripture loads of kids who are ministering even before society thought they could that's a whole other thing again isn't it um okay let's go let's let's wind this up for our last couple of minutes uh let's go on to top tips so <laughs> bearing in mind you have a very particular narrative that's that's very different to a lot of people's but there are people out there i'm guessing in your kind of position who are not who don't have this kind of platform to say look this is real this is us so what top tips have you found to survive, dare I say, venture into thrive at times, which have kept you going during everything you've been through and the shielding part of this weird relationship? Top tips for other shielders. So I think the first thing I would say is that even though I am obviously a priest, at the same time, we now know that there are many, many people who have experienced grief during this dreadful time. Um, tens of thousands of people who have had to experience and walk through grief in a way that none of us would ever have planned and that completely makes fall away i suppose all of our social rituals that we would expect during a time like this you know you would expect to have the doorbell ringing and someone bringing a casserole to your door and hanging on a out on the sofa with tissues whether you want them to be there or not yeah, but you'd there. yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. You, you'd expect to have the big funeral and, and the tears and the hugs yeah. and and so for me it has been about having that stripped away and how on earth do I deal with grief in this but in answer to your question about a, a tip I think what I would say is that embrace where you are and you can spend all of your time wishing that things were different and that you were perhaps, if you had to experience grief, doing it in the way that we normally would, but embrace it. So for me, um, this experience of grief, even though at times it has definitely been lonely and has definitely been isolating, it has also in its own way been peaceful because there are no expectations on me at the risk of stating the obvious to go out of the house or to participate in the social stuff. So when I've needed, to, to be at home, to be hanging out in the swing in my back garden, to, to sleep, yeah. of just letting yourself be in that moment. And I think I would say that both for people who are grieving and also for people who are just embracing this shielding thing of if you need to sleep, sleep. If you need to hang out with Netflix, hang out with Netflix. If you want to do something productive, like learning Greek or Hebrew or knitting, that's great, you go for it. But <laughs> if, if what you need to do is just to be in the moment, that's okay. And when everything is stripped away of all of our social rituals, of all of our routines, of all of the things that we see as being normal life, who are we? And, and just embracing that and dealing with it. Um, the other thing that I think I would say is, in my particular case, because for such a long time I found it so, so difficult to pray, in many times, particularly as priests, but certainly as Christians generally, there can be an expectation that we know what to say, that we have the words, and that it's perfectly okay to say, dear God, and it all comes out. But in moments like this, I haven't had the words. So, as I said earlier, sometimes it's been about looking at those pictures. For me, one of the things that's been very helpful is listening to music. So music that forms a prayer, even if it isn't a traditional prayer. Yeah. So one of the ones that I've listened to an awful lot is called Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns. Oh, um, I know that, and yeah. It's a song, yeah, it's, it's a song that says, um, 
God, by now I was sure you would have reached down and taken away our pain and sorrow. But instead I hear a quiet voice saying, I'm with you. I'm with you in the storm. Um, so if you can't pray, listen to a piece of music that feels prayerful for you. If you can't pray the extempore prayer, pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray a, a liturgy prayer because sometimes the prayers that are written down get a bit of grief for being too formal. But I have found in this last year that when you don't have the words, they give you the words. Um, and then accept help when it's offered. Because this, both the scenario of being stuck in the house with Chris when he was alive, and then also the shielding which has continued on afterwards, has meant that as a vicar, I'm used to being the helper. I'm used to being the person who finds somebody else's needs, identifies them, and does my level best to meet them. Yeah. But now, as both shielding clergy and also as bereaved clergy, I'm having to allow other people to help me. So in the beginning, I had those lovely food parcels with how many potatoes and dodgy carrots? Like, we yeah, had those two, we had two bags of pears in one of ours. I'm like, who the <laughs> hell needs two bags of pears? Anyway, yeah. so it was nice it. <laughs> and to be perfectly honest, waking up and discovering a food parcel on the doorstep in some ways was a relief because we needed it. But at the same time, it was also really humbling of having to accept that in this moment in time, I can't be in control. I can't do for myself. I yeah. have to accept other people. And then I've also had a gorgeous neighbor down the road who at one point put her phone number through my letterbox of, if you need anything collecting, I'm here. I'd never met her before. She had never met me. Since then, we've become friends. And multiple times a week, she texts me if I'm just popping down to Sainsbury's. Do you need anything? Do you need anything collecting? So accept the help. Swallow your pride if you have to. Um, and accept the help that's offered. And finally, mm -hmm. absolute final top tip, if you decide that you would really like to change your hair and having had nice long hair that you decide it would be fabulous to go short and funky, don't do that four weeks before all of the hairdressers shut down. Because <laughs> that's what I did. So now I am rocking really interesting lockdown hair because my hair was down here and it wouldn't have mattered. And I thought, no, I'm gonna go for a really short funky spiky cut. And four weeks later, all of the hairdressers shut down. Thanks. That would be a top tip to avoid. Yeah, yeah. My, my, I like my hair like this. This, um, this is perfect, <laughs> even though my mother hates it, but it's fine. Um, there's issues there. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I go to the hairdressers every time. And a new hairdresser, I moved to Oxford area a year ago. And I went in with quite kind of long and it was growing out and it was straggly. And I'm like, I just need a really like, scissor cut on top and, and shave. And they're like, are you sure? Like, yeah, trust me. And of course, yeah. just before lockdown came in, on, I think I was due to have my hair cut on March 17th. And at that point, the salon shut and said, we just can't do it. And I'm like, oh, but it, it needs to be, and it's going in and out. And, and I just, I, so about a week and we went to the big website and bought a famous and knowing me as you do katie my hair is normally blue pink purple green every and color funky so you know like the color's gone there's lots of gray you know so just top tips if you have to do a crazy haircut feel free just don't do it before a worldwide pandemic if you can carefully Charlotte, you always look fabulous anyway, whatever colour your hair is, whether you're in PJs with no makeup or hair done and face done for camera, you always look fabulous. Um, and I'm always amazed by you. And, you know, we don't see each other in, in real space very often. And I, I watch you with interest. I'm not stalking you, but I watch, I watch your life unfold. Share. <laughs> I'm the neighbour with the telescope looking through your letterbox. Um, right. through a closed eye that doesn't work um but, but you know i kind of see your life unfold through through the lens of facebook and i just think you are utterly remarkable so thank you for talking with me on my series of recordings of clergy shielding have a fabulous day um give adam an appropriate squeeze from all of your lovely friends out here in in this in the social media world and um and we'll see you soon thank you so much okay great thanks Katie. Bye. Bye.